Oh, shake your head in agreement with that. <laughs> I heard your voice too, all right? And so, well, that's great and uh, very good. Okay, we're looking together in 1 Kings, please. I, I'm doing my best here on Sunday mornings. I find consistently that the preacher keeps going over and over and over, which you don't seem to mind. You seem to really love it. But the junior church workers and the nursery workers, uh, they are, you know, getting think, they're thinking, about, you know, the strike is in the air. Everybody seems to get by with a strike. And so when the nursery workers and the junior church workers go on strike, we're going to have problems. So we want to do our best here, we want to be honoring to the Lord and to his word, but also want to have plenty of time here for preaching. And so this morning, let's look together in 1 Kings chapter 16. I want to introduce to you today someone that many of you perhaps will be familiar with, but uh, perhaps some that will be a new to you. But I would ask us all to, with fresh eyes and open ears here, to consider this man in the Bible that we'll commit some time to here over the next few weeks. And he is perhaps in a list of important prophets. He would certainly be at the top of that list. And God used him at a particular time in the life of Israel. And we're going to consider him. His name is Elijah. Elijah. And uh, in order to really grasp and understand the ministry and the development of Elijah, we need to understand the times uh, that Elijah lived in. We need to understand what was going on around him, what it was that developed and defined uh, his ministry and how God would use him. And I hope that this will be a help to us this morning as we look together in 1 Kings chapter 16. I want you to begin reading with me, if you would please, at verse 30. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. 1 Kings 16 and verse 30 introduces us to someone. His name is Ahab. He is the son of Omri. He has this distinction. The Bible says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. He is the MVP. He is the goat in our, in our generation. He's the greatest of all time at this point when it comes to Israel and doing evil. There is nobody like him thus far that has been a king over Israel. We're speaking of the northern kingdom of Israel. Look at verse 31, and it came to pass as if it had been a light thing. So it meant nothing to him. It wasn't a big deal to him to do something for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nabat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ithbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Again, look at verse 30. The Bible says that he did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And now he has this distinction that he will have done more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. And then verse 34, there's a description of an action that takes place during the reign of Ahab. And it's significant, verse 34, and I, I, we're going to spend some time on it today because I think it really establishes what Elijah was facing and what was going on around him. The Bible says, in his days, that would be Ahab's days, did Hale, the Bethlehite, build Jericho. He laid the foundation thereof in Abram, his firstborn, and set up the gates thereof in his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by Joshua, the son of Nun. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, can we please? Father in heaven, we come before you now, humbled, Lord, today by you, by your goodness, by your amazing grace. Lord, we're thankful today that our chains have been taken off. We're thankful today for the cross that was sung up by the choir. And we're appreciative of God's people gathering together. But now, Lord, all is vain. Unless the Spirit of God has free reign in our hearts and our lives, unless the Word of God be preached and proclaimed in such a way, Lord, that you would be glorified, exalted, and that your people would be fed. Lord, today we appeal to you and we desire of you that, uh, Lord, you would do a work in the hearts. Lord, that you would help us for this moment that we're together here for these few minutes. Lord, that we would be focused. Lord, that there would be an interest in our heart and our mind. Lord, that our ears would be attentive and that our hearts would be open, that they would be inclined to the truth that you would have for us. Lord, as we seek to consider Elijah, your prophet, your man, a man you call at a specific time for a specific task, Lord, recognizing what we, he was dealing with and what was happening around him, Lord, may we see some uh, relation to this. And Lord, may we also be a people who are affected 
And Lord, may we be a people who are focused on you and on your word. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, if you do not have a Bible and you'd like to have one, we'd be glad for you to receive one. If you'll see one of us after church this morning in the lobby, we would be glad to grab one for you. We want you to have one. I want you to do something. Leave your Bibles marked, if you would please, in 1 Kings. And if you're, if you're good at finding stuff in the Bible, uh, and, and that's all right if you're not, I want you to go to James chapter 5. James chapter 5 and verse 17. I want you to see this. This is a verse that is probably one that uh, it's certainly one that I committed to memory many years ago. I don't know of a week, certainly, that goes by, if not every couple of days, that this truth is not brought to my mind. James chapter 5 and verse 17. The Bible says this, Elias, and this is referencing Elijah that we're going to read about here this morning or talk about. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years, in six months. Notice verse 18, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. I like that verse. There's a couple of things that jump out to me in James chapter 5 and verse 17. First of all, this mighty prophet of God was a man who was subject to like passions as we are. You get hungry, he got hungry. You're afraid, he was afraid. You know loneliness, he knew loneliness. He, there was a connection that we have, and that transcends time transcends ge geographical location. It transcends, and we get this. And he was a man who was subject to like passions as we are. Uh, in our vernacular, he put his shoes on. He laced his sandals up the same way that we would. He woke up in the morning, and his, his breath was bad, just like your husband's, right? And he dealt with things. He had problems in life. He had insecurities in life. We see those exposed throughout his life. And yet this man, who was a man subject to like passions as we are, prayed earnestly. And he prayed for two things here, the Bible says. He prayed that it wouldn't rain, and then he prayed that it would rain. So oftentimes we focus in on when he prays and God sends rain. But I want you to know something. Elijah prayed that it wouldn't rain. Because Elijah cared very much for his people. He cared very much for his nation, the nation of Israel, and he had such a burden for them. And he was a little bit misguided in that, and just in this, he even felt like he was the only one who really cared about them. And the Lord had to teach him that there were several thousand who had not bent their knee, or their knee rather, had not bowed down and were not following after false gods. And he wasn't alone in his desire, but he felt and he carried this load as if he were the only one caring for his nation, the nation of Israel. I cannot give you this good truth here without spending just a little bit of time in development of where Israel is at at this time as a nation. Israel is that family that was promised to Abraham, a seed that would grow and be like the sands of the, of the ocean, to be like the stars of the sky in number, without number. Abraham was promised this, and God gave him a son by the name of Isaac. And from Isaac, this promise that was given to Abraham would go to Isaac. And then it would go upon Isaac's son, Jacob, whose name would later be changed to Israel. Israel, speaking of one who has power, or one who has position with God. Israel, the man, Jacob, and his family would end up through a series of God-ordained events in Egypt. In Egypt, they would stay for 400 plus years until God would send a man by the name of Moses to take them out. Moses would lead them out of Egypt, a family that has blossomed now into a nation. They're going somewhere. God didn't bring them out just to let them wander or to be squandered. God brought them out to bring them into the land that he had for them, a land of promise. In that land, it was full of people who had forsaken God, who had turned from God, who were idolaters, and who had worked against God. God would do something. One, he would bring Israel into that land. Two, God would deal with the inhabitants of that land in a disciplinary fashion. And we'll talk about that in a moment. That nation that God had taken from such humble beginnings found itself wandering after a, a series of decisions and then ultimately in rebellion and not entering in. They find themselves wandering until God removes that generation and brings Joshua on the scene. Moses brought them out. Joshua will lead them in. Joshua type of Christ. They will enter in and they will begin to see victory. One of the first places that they'll have victory will be in a place called Jericho. You've heard perhaps the story of Jericho, how the walls came down and how a great victory on a mighty stronghold in this land that God was bringing them into was given. A victory was given. After they've been in the promised land for a while, 
The children of Israel did not follow God in complete obedience. And just as God said would be the case, those folks that were in the land that they allowed to remain in the land began to affect them. They began to enter into relationships. They began to bring them as a part of their families and their homes. And they began to bring in their idolatry. And very quickly, the people of Israel had problems, and that led to something. It led to ups and downs in a time period called the Judges, where God would judge them, and God would deal with them, and God would deliver them. Until eventually it came to the point where Israel, the family that became a nation, brought out by Moses, led in by Joshua, delivered by Judges, would cry out that God would give them a king. They wanted a king like everybody else around them, and so God gave them what they asked for. God gave them a king. He reminded them of the problems and the, how it would complicate their life to have a king, but God gave them a king. The first king that he gave them was Saul. Saul, naturally looking, stood head and shoulders above the crowd. If you were looking at a person that seemingly would be a good-looking king, it was Saul. The problem with Saul was his heart. He had a heart problem. Saul was not a man with a heart after God. Saul had a heart for Saul. Saul wanted what he wanted, when he wanted it, and he violated God's directions and God's commands. And because of that, God set him down, and God brought up another king. That second king of Israel was the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was the giant killer. He was the keeper of the sheep. That was the David that stepped onto the battlefield in the name of God and fought Goliath while everybody else trembled for days and would not face him. This David, who would go from obscurity to being known and becoming the anointed of the Lord, would go on to become king. He would be described as a bloody king. Israel at that time is a nation being established, and David is fighting the fights, and he is dealing with a lot of the issues that had been created by the previous generations and their decisions. David will settle the land, and David has a heart for God like none other. He's described in the book of Acts as being a man after God's own heart. Not perfect but a man whose heart was fixed on God. And when he was wrong, God dealt with him. And when he was wrong, he returned back to God. He confessed his sin. David has that testimony. David would have a son by the name of Solomon. David loved God so much he wanted to build God a house. He wanted to build him a temple. God would not allow him to because of his bloody reputation. And so he brought Solomon on the scene. Solomon's son, a, a, a very much a testimony of God's grace in David's life that Solomon would become king. Where David was a warrior, Solomon has wisdom. Israel, that nation, is growing now and developing, and they're becoming in that area very well known. Solomon, with his wisdom, is ruling and reigning, and because of the peace that his father delivered to him by being a bloody man, Solomon is heaping on and bringing up the country, the nation of Israel. People are coming from all over. The queen from the south will come to visit him. They'll bring treasures to him. They'll want to hear of his wisdom. They'll watch his men servants and his lady servants as they rise and as they sit. They want to know everything that he's doing because the hand of God is on him. The wisdom of God is poured out in Solomon's life. Solomon opens the door. He loves many women. He has many wives. He has concubines, and his heart is turned from God. And idolatry, unfortunately, becomes a part of Solomon. Solomon has a son. His name is Rehoboam. Rehoboam, with all the Proverbs of Solomon... With all the words that have been given to him, I believe impacted by that, but also impacted by the testimony of Solomon. He does not listen to the wise counsel of older men around him after his father has passed, but he listens to those that are his peers. And where he had an opportunity to right some things that were wronged and to develop a right relationship with the nation of Israel, he digs in. And he basically tells them, if you thought my dad was tough, wait till you have me as a king. The kingdom of Israel, the nation, is split into a northern kingdom and into a southern kingdom. The story of Israel now will unfold in First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, and we'll go from Saul, David, Solomon now to a split kingdom, the northern kingdom, which will be called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which will be called Judah. And Judah will be Jerusalem, the capital city. And Jerusalem is the temple that Solomon built. In Jerusalem is the temple where the glory of God came and filled it. And Jerusalem is where people were directed to make their pilgrimage back to on occasion to re recognize holy days and to be involved in sacrifice. Jeroboam, whom God gave an opportunity to do something in Israel, 
is insecure. He's afraid that if the people from the north travel to the south, to Jerusalem to worship there, that their hearts will be taken from him and that he'll lose the kingdom that God has allowed him to have. And so he does something. He makes two golden calves and he raises up two worship centers. He then begins to appoint just about anybody and everybody that wanted to to be the priests or to be involved in worship and service inside of Israel. He leads the people and idolatry. In 1 Kings chapter 14, turn there with me, would you please, very quickly, 1 Kings chapter 14, the Bible says regarding Jeroboam, in verse 9, but hast done evil, speaking of Jeroboam, Jeroboam hast done evil above all that were before thee, for thou hast gone and made thee other gods and molten images to provoke me to anger, and hast cast me behind thy back. Jeroboam brings Israel now, coming from Saul, David, Solomon, now Jeroboam in the north. He throws God behind his back, and he enters into idolatry with the people, and he directs the people to these golden calves. This is not the first time you've heard of a golden calf in regards to Israel. You heard of the golden calf when Moses waited up in the mountain while God was dealing with him and giving him instruction for the people. Aaron and those that were with him made a golden calf for the people to worship the calf and the bull as a symbol throughout the ages of mankind and idolatry. All the way back into Egypt and in India and various places in the east, we see, as we study even history, we see the imagery of the bull. The bull spoke of fertility. The bull spoke of strength. And you see in Romans chapter 1, the Bible gives us the breakdown and the teardown of the fabric of mankind and that when mankind would not remember God and would not consider God, they began to worship the beast. You see, the natural man wants everything and anything but the one true living God. And so they raise up idols. The Israelites had been around all sorts of idols in Egypt. They had an image of an idol there that was a bull. They saw idolry, idolatry all around them. This was what God warned them about. This is what God told them to avoid. And now Jeroboam, the king in the northern portion of Israel, establishes for the people to go there. In nearly 58 years, listen to this, from the time of Solomon, the success where all the world is coming to Israel to see what it is that God is doing. In approximately 58 years from that time until this time when we see this fellow by the name of Ahab step on the scene and his dad Omri. Israel, that nation that drew the world's attention, now is plunged, plunged headfirst into the reign of Ahab. The reign of Ahab, a man who gets the award for being the worst. A man who gets the award for provoking the Lord God of Israel more than any other king. A man who thought nothing of it but to continue on in the idolatry of Jeroboam. Who thought nothing of it to marry Jezebel. He said, what's the matter who he marries? It, well, as the king, when people would marry others, when you speak of royalty, that was a merging of nations. For one thing, God had been very specific regarding Israel and marriage. For Ahab to step out and to marry someone who was of the Sidonians, who were historically a people who had been opposed to Israel, had even, had even caused conflict and brought difficulty to their life. They were worshipers, not of the true God, but they were worshipers of Baal and of the goddess Ashtaroth. Baal, the, the false god, was believed to be the one of fertility and the one that was believed to bring rain and to allow crops to grow. Ashtaroth, a goddess, uh, believed uh, to be the god of war. And these folks would go and do things and be led and they would blame it on or claim it as what their gods were directing them to do. They would offer sacrifices to these gods. They would sacrifice their children to these gods. Israel. In just a little over half a century has a man now who sits on the throne who thinks nothing 
of not only building places for Baal to be worshipped, but also to raise up an altar to worship himself, to sacrifice himself. There are others who have been involved in idolatry, but not to the extent and not to the level that Ahab is now. And what we have here, friend, is a very difficult place, a very dark day in the nation of Israel. In a mountain range called Gilead, a difficult place. You've heard of Gilead before. Jeremiah the prophet would say, is there not a balm in Gilead? In Gilead, there was a tree that was raised there and uh, natural to that area that from the sap, there was medicinal purposes. Gilead is mentioned in other portions of Scripture as being a place where spices and things were traded. And Jeremiah was saying, is there not a healing in Israel? Is there not provided? Could God himself not heal Israel? Elijah was from Gilead. Elijah, in a sense, was a balm, I believe, of Gilead. A healing voice. One who had concern. One who was moved. One who was affected by what was happening around him. So difficult were the days that Ahab now is ruling in so outright open in rebellion towards God and the things of God, a man, in verse 34, whose name means God lives, who is from Bethel, which is the house of God, a man whose name means God lives, a man who's from a place that is called the house of God, does something. And it's just... Put here in the scripture for us, if we read by it, we don't take a whole lot of account into it, but we need to really take some time and consider what it is that he does. He rebuilds a city that God destroyed. He rebuilds a city that God, in Joshua chapter 6, told Joshua to tell the people, whoever it is that rebuilds this city will bring a curse upon them the life of their firstborn and their last. That's what will become of you. Why would God destroy Jericho? Why would it be such a big deal? Why is it so interesting or telling of the days that Ahab ruled in, that Elijah was being developed in? Why is it so important for us to recognize this? Jericho was a powerhouse. Jericho was that mighty, massive city walled, that the children of Israel would come to first as they come into the promised land for God to bring victory. It causes us to ask the question, why would God destroy Jericho? Why would God drive and why would God want the inhabitants of that city to be removed? Why would God deal with them in such a way? Take your Bibles, please, and let's take a little trip here for a few moments, can we please? Turn with me to the book of Genesis, the book of Origins. It's in Genesis chapter 1 that I find out where I came from. I realize that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. The right biblical view of things is that God made all that there is. In Genesis chapter 15, God is dealing with Abram. Abram is in the land that someday will be the land that Israel will claim. And in Genesis chapter 15, look at the verses 13 through 16. And he... God said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. God was telling Abram what to expect. This is the promise of God. God knew that the children of Israel would be in a land that would afflict them. Who would that be? That would be Egypt, and they would be there for how long? Four hundred years. And also that nation, Egypt, whom they shall serve, will I judge. And afterward shall they come out with great what? Do you remember when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt after the Passover took place and they were on their way out? Do you remember what the Egyptians were doing? They were giving them gold and silver and providing them with the very things that would sustain them as a nation and help them with their getting their tabernacle built and the various things that would be required. They spent all that time working for them for nothing and being afflicted. Now God is recovering to them that time and sending them out with that. Read on with me, please. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards shall they come out with great substance. And thou shalt go, speaking of Abram, to thy fathers in peace, 
that shall be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall come out hither again where you're at, your descendants four generations from now will come into. Why the hesitation and why will they go in? What will take place in God's timetable for the children of Israel to come into the promise? And why would God destroy Jericho? Why would God want those inhabitants driven out? For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Do you know what God was doing there in that time? God was not only teaching his children, teaching his people something, the nation of Israel, but God was being long-suffering. God was being long-suffering to the people who lived in that land. The iniquity was not yet what? Full. What's the big deal? In the times of Ahab and Jezebel, that somebody would come along and say, hey, I want to rebuild Jericho. What's the big deal? The big deal is that Jericho represented all that was wrong with the promised land. It represented people wholly given to idolatry. It represented those whose iniquity had become full. Go with me now, would you please, to Leviticus chapter 18. Leviticus chapter 18. The children of Israel now will be directed by God regarding entering into the promised land, entering into the land that had been foretold that would be theirs. Four generations and now their iniquity is full and God is now bringing in judgment. God is using Israel to bring judgment. Leviticus 18 verses 3 through 4, After the doings of the land of Egypt wherein ye dwelt shall ye not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan, whither I bring you, shall ye not do. Neither shall ye walk in their ordinances. Ye shall do my judgments, and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am what? The Lord your God. Could we jump ahead? There's a whole list here of things. God's going to give them some very direct instructions about their behavior and what it's to look like. In opposition to the Egyptians, in opposition to how the people were behaving inside this land that God would bring to them. Look at verse 20, would you please, of Leviticus chapter 18. Moreover, thou shalt not lie carnally with thy neighbor's wife to defile thyself with her. And thou shalt not let any of thy seed pass through the fire to Molech, neither shalt thou profane the name of thy God. I am the Lord. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Neither shalt thou lie with any beast to defile thyself therewith. Neither shall any woman stand before a beast to lie down there too. It is confusion. Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things. Look at this next statement. For in all these the nations are defiled which I cast out before you. What was the fullness of iniquity? This is the fullness of iniquity. The fullness of iniquity, and there's much more there. And I would challenge you, and I would ask you to read that and to see, but it's a description of the behavior of those in Egypt and the behavior of those in Canaan that God was saying, their iniquity is full, and it's time for them to be dealt with. And I'm using Israel coming in. God was long-suffering and bringing them in. But God said, I'm bringing you in now to drive out the inhabitants, and I don't want you in any way, shape, or form to behave this way. I don't want you to walk in these paths. I want you to walk in my paths, in my ordinances. I want you to do things my way. I want you to see here, Verse 24, Defile not ye yourselves in any of these things, for in all these the nations are defiled, which I cast out before you, and the land is defiled. Therefore I do visit the iniquity thereof upon it. Look at this next statement. And the land itself vomiteth out her inhabitants. Canaan land, God said the land itself is sick. Of what's going on in it. So what's the big deal in Jericho being rebuilt? Jericho was the pinnacle, was that massive city 
who thought by their walls, their walls so wide that chariots could run around them, their walls so wide that protected them from those that were around them, their walls that fortified their position, their walls that enabled their behavior, their walls that protected them to continue on in what was described here. They looked all around them and they saw no one that could deal with their walls. And then one day God brought some people in. And God had them, and you know the story, God had them march around the city of Jericho each day a time until they came to that final day when they were to walk multiple times and then they were to blow the trumpet. And when they did blow the trumpet, after having been quiet, God did something to Jericho, that mighty city, carnal, doing what they wanted, when they wanted, worshiping their gods, bringing their children, walking their children through the fires of Molech, being wholly given to that, hiding behind their walls. God said, let me show you what I can do with your walls. <laughs> and they were fully exposed. But consider the grace of God in that. There was a household that was spared. Well, don't, don't, don't be ugly towards our God. He was long-suffering. His witness is seen throughout the creation. Mankind has known God and known of the God. God has made sure of that through revelation. Don't be mad at that God who suffered long with these people and gave them season to repent. For in the very city that God would reveal his strength and the weakness of the strongest man, in that very city, there was a woman who was a fallen woman who believed in God and her household was spared. And her name would go on to become a part of, in her life, the people of God would become a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. That's God's grace. But it's also exposed in the midst of God's judgment. When that Jericho was destroyed, God said, whoever comes along and rebuilds this, there's a curse on them because I don't want it to be rebuilt. In the days of Elijah, in the days of Ahab, if somebody comes along and they said, you know what? I will rebuild what God has cast down. Do you know what that is? That's an insult to God. This in a real simple way. It's like a child knowing what their parents don't want them to do and doing it anyway to show them I, I'll do what I want. And that was the ultimate, that is the spirit of Ahab and Jezebel. We know what is right, but we will do what we want. If I want to lay with somebody else's wife, I will. If a man wants to lay with a man, then he will. If a woman with a woman, then we will. If a man with an animal, then we will. And there is no God and there is no order to tell us that we can. You say, preacher, that's tough. That's the Bible. And I don't know if you're paying attention to what's happening in the world today, but there is a outright rebellion against our Creator. And it's not just one group, it's across the board. I remind you that there was a plenty dealing with there regarding the marriage and the husband being faithful to his wife. And I believe if we were to consider the fracturing in our society, we would go back to that relationship between a husband and a wife and that commitment and that covenant. The sacredness of that. The sacredness of the relationship that God has given to a husband and a wife. God said, don't build that city. If you do, who's going to pay for it? Your children. There's two thoughts here. One is the thought that literally this man sacrificed his children for that city to be built, literally. Or perhaps it's just simply that they died, they were cursed because of what he did. You know, it breaks my heart today. Who is it? Who is it that's being sacrificed on the altar of man's violation 
and rebellion of God. Children. Children. Well, you say, preacher, that's a bleak picture. I want you to know what Elijah was dealing with. So in a mountain range called Gilead, rough country, stony country, there's a man who's coming up. He's described as Elisha the Tishbite. He's coming from a difficult place. As a matter of fact, when John the Baptist comes on the scene in the ministry of Christ, there are those who hearken back to Elijah because of the roughness of who Elijah is, the spirit of Elijah. He's coming up and he loves his nation. He loves his people. He loves his God. And he begins to pray. And his desire, listen, if you miss this part of the story, then you don't understand when he stands up on the top of Mount Carmel and he cries and he says, hey, show them who the real God is. That wasn't just one morning when he woke up and he desired that. This is something that's burning in his heart and it's burning in his spirit. He wants his people to turn back to God. Oh, God! The Bible doesn't show us this portion until we get to the book of James, but it would tell us that he's praying that there not be any rain. You see, rain to Israel was part of God's blessing upon them. God promised them at the particular seasons that rain would be needed that he would send that. In Deuteronomy chapter 11, but the land whither you go to possess is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven, a land which the Lord thy God careth for. The eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. And it shall come to pass if ye shall hearken diligently unto my commandments which I command you this day to, the, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn and thy wine and thine oil, and I will send grass in the fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and you turn not aside, and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain when it rained the people of Israel would walk out and say this is God caring for us we have a few farmers in our church and when it's dry they'll say hey preacher pray for rain pray for rain and we do and we should for their sake but I don't think that you and I really understand to Israel the significance of rain and Elijah began to pray, and he said, Lord, would you shut up the heaven because it's the only thing that perhaps will bring my people to realizing there is one God. You see, they were giving Baal the credit for the rain. Thunder. They were giving the credit to anybody and everything but God. And Elijah said, please, God. Please, God. Help them to see who you are. I'm out of time. Who will pray earnestly that our attention will be directed to the true and living God? What parent is there who ought to pray earnestly and fervently for our children and for our grandchildren? that their attention would be directed to the living God. I fear, a holy fear for our young people. I fear for our country and the believers in our country that we have forgotten the living God. Who will pray? Revival will come. Even in the time of Ahab, there will be people who will believe in God, even with Ahab as king and Jezebel as queen. But it begins with Elijah the Tishbite up in Gilead. Saying, boy, these are some difficult things. There's outright open rebellion against the Most High God. Please, God, do something. Please, God, do something. 
Will you pray for your children? Will you pray for your grandchildren? Will you pray for your nation? Will you pray for this next generation that they'll know the Lord? Will you pray for each other that we will see and recognize the true God? That we'll worship Him as we should? So easy, isn't it, to become blinded by the God's little g of this world. So we don't have Baal and Ashtaroth. No, we have mammon. We have things. We have a sense of security, like Jericho behind their walls. We think that God can't get to us. We think that God does not see. God sees. Oh, listen. Give us some people who in the spirit of Elijah will see things in a sober perspective as they really are and say, God, please direct our attention back to you. There is no man, there is no movement that has the cure for our country the way that you need it and I need it. What's needed is an outright, holy turning to the living God. Will you be like Elijah? Will you pray? Every time you think about things, would you pray? Would you allow the soberness of the moment to resonate in your heart and say, well, I need to be praying. I need to be praying. God, please help us to turn to you. It's a scary thing to ask God not to send rain. Three plus years without rain, it'll bring drought, it'll bring great complications. But what Elijah wanted to do was for his people to see God work. Well, I want to see God work, don't you? I want to see God work in our lives, in our young people's lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Can we, Father in heaven, thank you for your goodness. Thank you for the word of God, sobering as it is. And direct and to the point is the word of God. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Help us, God. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. I thank you so much for your attentiveness this morning. I'm trusting that this is where God would have us in his word, and this is the message for today. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm not sure that I'm saved. I don't know for sure if I were to die today that heaven would be my home. I'm not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not, I don't know about that. I have questions about that. I'd like to know more about that. You'd say, Preacher, please pray for me. I don't know that I'm saved. Would you raise your hand this morning who would say that? Preacher, please pray for me. I'm not sure that I'm saved on my way to heaven. If you're here this morning and say, Preacher, I'm saved, I see your hand. God bless you. I see your hand as well. And yours as well. If you're here this morning, you know that you're saved. But you get where the Bible is coming from here in this. And you see that pressing need that was in Elijah's life to pray Maybe you have a son, a daughter, grandchildren. It presses upon us, or even our own lives, to pray that we would turn right to God. There's so many things that we become enthralled with and entangled with why our direction needs to be towards God. Who's here this morning to say, Preacher, like Elijah, I too want to be a person of prayer, praying to see God work. Would you lift your hand? Who would say that this morning? Preacher, like Elijah, I want to be that person of prayer. God sees our hands, He knows our hearts. Here in just a moment, we'll have an invitation. If you raised your hand this morning or did not, then you said, Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved. I don't know that I'm on my way to heaven. I don't have that confidence. I, I don't have that understanding. In a moment, would you leave your seat and come forward and let somebody show you? They'll sit with you down front, will not embarrass you at all. There's men and there are ladies who would be thrilled to show you from God's Word how you can know the best news that you'll ever hear. That's the news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The choir sang about it, the old rugged cross. The quartet talked about the chains falling off. That's available to you today through Christ. Don't hesitate this morning. If you do not know the Lord as your Savior, here in just a moment when we stand to our feet and the piano begins to play, I want you to leave your seat and come forward and let somebody help you with that. And then could I ask you, dear friend, would you as Elijah recognize the need? There he was in Mount Gilead. Would you recognize the need for God's people to pray? Would we make a commitment to that today? Perhaps you could come to the altar this morning and begin that work, perhaps there at your seat. Let's take this seriously, shall we? Let's stand to our feet, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We're asking the Lord to move and stir in our hearts. 
If this morning you raised your hand and you did not know that for sure that you're saved, won't you come today and let somebody talk to you about that? You come now. Don't, don't, don't hesitate. Don't wait. If this morning you're saved and you said, boy, preacher, there was something in that for me. You come today, would you please? Brother John, 